Today, an inflation masterclass, part two, all about supercycles. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, web notice post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined again by Damien Classen from Nucleus Wealth and What the Wealth Fund. Hi, Damien. Hi, Martin. Well, we had a great uh, exposure on Friday to the first part of your story about inflation. Significantly positive feedback, I should say, over the weekend when we, when we posted it. But they're interesting. There were a couple of questions that people ask. For example, well, hang on a moment, isn't growth in money supply inflation? How do you define inflation? And are the metrics that people are using actually sensible or not? And what about house prices? Aren't they inflationary? So I thought you might want to segue the next part of this and <laughs> cover some of those on the way through. Yeah, yeah look, I mean, and it, and it all comes back, I guess, to I'm pretty focused at the moment, certainly from an investment point of view, on, on what is the uh, what do central banks think inflation is? Because that's that's what they're going to run their monetary and um, their, their monetary policy off. But it is important to note that that um, you know if they're if they're looking at the wrong thing, then um, then that means that 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 there's going to be factors that that are flowing into their inflation numbers that they can't explain. And the reason why they can't explain it is because they're looking at the wrong the wrong inflation. And so um, and you spoke about house prices, and that's you know that's that's probably one of them. Um, there's certainly been asset price inflation. Um, you know, certainly wouldn't um, I, I wouldn't argue against that. Uh, you know, we've seen markets are, are trading on basically, you know, uh, record highs. To, to, you know, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, stock markets, whether it's um, whether it's bonds, in terms of valuations, um, you know, everything's looking expensive. And so um, yeah, so it's a pretty good argument to say, well, there is inflation. It's just been in in, in asset markets. Um, uh, and and then the question you know comes back down to well. What are central banks going to do about that, and what does that mean for economic growth? And you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of other factors that come out of that. But but um, yeah, are we looking at the right type of inflation? Is um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a valid question. Um, I'll 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 define for this purposes. I think maybe we can come back and do another time. We can we can talk more about the different types of inflation. But maybe if we can sort of hone in on 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 this discussion of saying, well, what we're really talking about here is is um, inflation as central banks would see it and, and how they would um, then run their interest rate policy, which would then determine what, um, you know, what equity is going to do and what bonds are going to do in terms of um, uh, affected by central banks. So the, the issue is, of course, how you define it. So there's lots of different ways of defining it. The way that central banks define it is that trimmed mean, the, you know, the, the underlying inflation number, right? Yep. Um, and, and there may well be um, factors that they aren't including, and it may even be that some inflation metrics are actually wrongly defined. For example, housing used to be in the numbers; it was taken out some time ago. There's a sort of rental plot proxy, but it's probably not adequate. The other one is money supply, right? So you know, a lot of people say, "Well, hang on a moment, isn't the flow of money just increasing very strongly?" And actually, over time, if you look carefully, the correlation between money supply and inflation is very poor. So there were times in history where money supply has been strong, no inflation, and vice versa. So it's not a simple, ah, there's inflation everywhere and we're just not seeing it, particularly, as you say, when it's central banks determining what to do based on a set of metrics that they determine, right? So in a way, what you're doing is walking within the box at the moment. But there's probably a, a separate conversation to be had about if you look beyond the box, then what do you see? Because there are other inflation metrics and other people running alternative inflation metrics that really make a very different story. Yeah, well, that's and actually I had one here to show that sort of, you know, as we're moving into this, the inventory changes, um, this is a, uh, a relatively simple um, version. This doesn't get too 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 complicated. All, all it's doing is saying, well, the US actually only changes their basket, so the basket of goods that go into the the um, uh, go into inflation numbers for the US only changes once every two years. And um, coronavirus had a huge shock, so so no sense in in um, uh, worrying about restaurant inflation or, or airline ticket inflation or, or whatever it is at the depths of the crisis when you couldn't fly anywhere and you couldn't eat at the restaurants. Um, and then then vice versa as, as you're coming out of it and, and just the, the whole part that people are spending on on different things, which is, um, you know, which is one of the, the factors I'm going to sort of jump into um, as we go through this is that, um, 
yeah, people are you've basically been restricted from spending on services. And so, the, and this is a measure that, that doesn't. It's it's basically saying that um, infla uh, that the uh, inflation was uh, understated during the coronavirus. So basically, that that um, yeah, the, the reported numbers were actually well below what the 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 actual numbers were. Having said that, the actual numbers were pretty weak anyway. We're talking about you know zero uh, percent inflation here versus maybe one percent. So. Uh, but then that's come out the other way. As, as we're coming out the other the other end of it, is that um, uh, the inflation numbers are overstating what uh, what's happening on at, at, at the ground level. Mm. This, but it's worth saying, isn't it? I think the point is that any measure of inflation is an artifice, right? It's based yeah. on certain assumptions. It's based on certain input data, and if that input data is incorrect, uh, or if the assumptions are wrong, then the output will be wrong as well. So that's no more, no less. It's it, it, it's not totally logical. It's not totally necessarily complete, but it is the stake in the ground that central banks around the world are using. Yeah, and and the number they're quoting is 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 almost certainly not your inflation rate. Even just mm. but your inflation rate versus my inflation rate is going to be different. We live in different cities. You know, we 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 buy different things. We have you know different you know whether it's kids or or, or, or not, and you know, there's all these other factors that are going into it. Whether I, I decide to put my um, you know, kids or, or um, into private schools or public schools, or, or whether I decide to, to go on a holiday or not go on a holiday, and where I decide to go on a holiday, all those factors make a difference as to, to what my inflation is, which is going to be different to to what your inflation is. And so, um, yeah, you know, keep in mind that um, the best we can do is 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 uh, well, from an investment point of view, we do need to assess what the, the central banks are doing. And then we do need to make comments where we think the central banks are, are getting that that measure wrong. Mm, spot on. Right. So, okay. So we've we've dealt with a, f a few different things so far. So the first first uh, group was sort of a lot about inflation and, and what's different today versus um, historically. Um, second part, then we we spoke around, a lot around commodity prices and in, in particular China and and how um, how much of the world is is sort of very much leveraged to what's happening in the Chinese Chinese housing market, and so. Um, that that discussion that if you're um, you know, a trillion dollars of, of of U.S. infrastructure spend, um, the they, the um, uh, consultancy is expecting that that's going to make about a point zero point three percent increase in the amount of steel and the amount of uh, copper that that's needed, which is really just a rounding error when um, you know there's probably thirty odd percent of those uh, commodities are being used just in the just in the Chinese housing market. And so a small change in the Chinese housing market will wipe away um, any changes. Um, and it looks like we're, having, we're going to have some changes in, in the demand. So the, so the last part I wanted to go on, though, before we get to um, the final stage, which is, which is what do you do about this within your portfolios? Hmm. But um, the, uh, the last part I wanted to get back to was um, this, this idea of an inventory super cycle. So I've said I don't think we're in a commodity super cycle because for a commodity super cycle you need to have volumes actually growing significantly, whereas we haven't got the volumes growing significantly. It's been all about supply side disruptions, um, and so. Uh, but I do think there's an inventory super cycle. So we're going through these shortages, and um, you know we all saw when the, when the coronavirus first hit, uh, we all the toilet paper was all of a sudden you know you couldn't couldn't get it for love or money on on. on um, on shelves, and then there was issues with things like masks and webcams, and, and then homewares, and, and now we've got these issues with cars. And um, the issue is whether these shortages are actually causing inflation within the system. And so, uh, if you look, let's say, at toilet paper, um, you know, there's, a, there's some websites that track uh, third-party sales of toilet paper on um, uh, on Amazon, and you can see that the price sort of went up three or four times uh, right at the start, and then it basically settled all the way back down to where it, where it came from. So it's those things where what we're talking about is this, this uh, a shortage in a particular good driving inflation in the very short term, but actually, you know what, toilet paper, um, there's no structural reason why toilet paper is going to be significantly more expensive. There's no structural reason why people are going to use more of it now than, than what they did before. And so um, the, the price returned back to, to, to where, it, um, where it came from. And that's what we're... So, um, so, so what I'm really exploring is this whole inventory cycle, and we're hearing about a lot of shortages and seeing a lot of shortages. Um, and so he's actually saying, well, where does that, um, what does that actually mean for, for inflation and where does that lead? And so, um, yeah, so this, this chart I've got up here is um, uh, one run by uh, just a, a very recent study um, by people looking at, at disruptions. And I think the key thing I'm sort of getting from this is very much that um, – 
as people's uh, choices and um, as people's uh, the, the, what they're demanding, the, the goods they're demanding, has has been through some quite significant changes through, through as you go in in and out of lockdown. You you see these waves of, um, of of all of a sudden, you know, we've got all these shortages. You know, right at the start, as I spoke about masks, toilet paper, webcams. Um, uh, mice, computers, all those types of things. As, as all of a sudden, people's kids had to uh, school, um, you know, homeschooling, and 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 so there was this huge demand for a whole bunch of things that hadn't actually seen that much demand. And then, as either the the, the demand either faded because it was just a short-term thing, or or the uh, the supply kicked in, um, we saw those come off. And then you get through the next one, and then the next one, as each, as each of those waves sort of um, occurs as people go through, you know, diff different changes in in demand. Um, so right now we've got these things um, so purchasing called purchasing manager purchasing manager indexes often called PMIs um, and basically they're a survey um, of people who are of, of businesses um, that are buying uh, goods and if you look through those at the moment um, all you're seeing is booms whether it's you know so you've got new orders um, you know it and um, uh, at, at significant highs the actual total manufacturing PMI is, is very high. Um, does look like it might have rolled over, so it's certainly come off its recent high, so, so something to keep an eye on, but, um, but certainly very high historically. Um, you look at backlogs of orders and, and they're sort of sitting at record highs. Um, this one on the, on the right, uh, customer inventories, and you can see that's sort of plumbing um, effectively 30-year you know, lows. Um, there's uh, the, the big one is this, Output prices. So this is the idea that um, that manufacturers have these have have this huge um, impetus to increase their costs now, and that costs are gonna, that cost is then going to start flowing into inflation. So that's the um, the one on the left there, where we can see that um, the when you survey the the manufacturing um, purchasing managers ab about what they think uh, the price the output prices are going to do is basically seventy percent of them roughly are, are saying that um, output prices are, are going up. So yeah, so, yeah, so um, and, and that's the concern. So, so the concern is, will this, will, do we have a, um, an, an inventory cycle or, or is this something new where um, manufacturers can no longer produce at the prices they used to be able to pr produce at, they're going to have to keep increasing prices and keep increasing prices again and again and again. And um, you know, my contention is is no. I, I think for most of these products, um, the vast majority of them, it's not about um, whether they're pre prepared to produce at the old price. They're, they're absolutely prepared to pr produce the old price. It's about a demand and supply mismatch. And so um, yeah. So with that, that's sort of the background to it. And but I wanna, what I wanted to do was really talk through what an inventory cycle is because I think there's there's some confusion often. And the numbers, it's, it's only when you see the numbers behind it that, that you really make sense as to, how, um, as to how powerful these cycles are. And, and inventory cycles tend to drive most recessions. So uh, both into the recession and out of the recession is, is exacerbated on the way down by inventory cycles and um, helped on the way out by inventory cycles as well. So um, I've, got, I've set up a, a basically a, a very simple model. Um, that I, that I want to run through for, to use this as an example. And so we've got three different uh, businesses here. We have a retailer who buys from a wholesaler who buys from a manufacturer. And so basically the retailer, whatever they sell, if they then go and order another 100 units the next month, um, they'll have an inventory left over, which is basically whatever they, whatever they ordered from the wholesaler, um, less whatever they sold, um, will, will, whatever's left over will sit in their inventory. And then the same thing happens with the manufacturer and the wholesaler. And so there's this, there's this lag period where if, if sales fall for a retailer, um, they'll, they'll, they then won't change their order to the wholesaler until the next period, and then the wholesaler won't change their order until the next period to the manufacturer. And, and the assumption I'm making um, is that all three of these, or sorry, that the retailer and the wholesaler both want to keep about 1.5 times um, whatever they're selling um, in a period, they want to keep that as inventory. So if they're selling 100 units, they want 150 units in inventory in case they have a bump a month. Um, and then they'll order another 100 units as, as time goes on. So does that make, make sense? Yes it, yes, it does. And I suppose the point there is that um, if, in fact, retailers don't sell, then they don't order more, right? The reverse yes. is also true. If things suddenly pick up, then, of course, they push the accelerator on the next orders, which then yep. trickles down the chain. 
Absolutely. And, mm. and, the, and because of the inventory effect, it's even greater than that. So, um, and these periods are all different. The other thing to remember as well, these periods are all different for every company. Sometimes it's days, sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's quarters. So, you know, depending upon if you're selling a, a car versus if you're selling fresh eggs, there's obviously a, a different time frame in terms of how many cars, how often you order cars and, and versus how often you might order eggs from your, um, from your suppliers. So, so I've got a, a drop in sales here now. So I'm introducing these the fourth, fifth, and sixth period. And we can see that like in the first, in that first period, the retailers dropped from 100 back to 90. And so what that means now is because he's only sold 90, um, he's now got 160 in his, in his inventory. Um, and so, um, and, and assuming that, you know, expecting 90 going onwards because we've entered this uh, coronavirus pandemic and, and your sales are dropped and you're not expecting them to bounce back to 100. So, so then he's saying, okay, well now, he actually only needs 135 sitting in his inventory every month because, um, uh, yeah, lower, lower amount of sales. So he needs 90 to sell for the next one. Um, what that means is he's, he's got this excess stock and it means the order from the wholesaler is actually only 65 now. So, yeah, so he's sold, thought he was going to sell 100, only sold 90, so he's left with 10 extra stock. Plus then he's gone, well, I'm only going to sell 90 going forward, so actually only, I actually need 15 less, less stock. So, so the net effect is that there's a, there's a much lower order going through the wholesaler in that first month. And then the wholesaler does exactly the same thing. They, you know, they, they thought they were going to sell 100, but they only, now they only sold 65. So they're sitting with this massive extra inventory. And, um, and so they only order 40 from the, uh, from the manufacturer. And you can see as you go down, you know, a 10% change for the retailer means a 35% change for the wholesaler and a 60% change for the manufacturer. So um, it's exponentially larger as you, as you sort of head down that, that, that supply chain. Um, then the next part you go to is, okay, so that's, that's, your, that's your downward cycle. Then, then you want the upward cycle is you go back to 100. So back from 90 to 100, the wholesaler now, um, so the retailer sells more than what he thought. So now he's only got 125, but he also now wants to get back to 150. So this time he's actually got to order 125. So instead of he's, he's been ordering 90 per month, now he needs to jump it to 125 and then he's going to go at 100 from there on. And the same thing happens with the wholesaler. Um, he's got left with even less stock, um, which means you know, the manufacturer gets his massive order. So you can see that massive change where, um, again, an 11% rise for the retailer means a 39% rise for the wholesaler and a 67% rise for the manufacturer. It's that real whip that happens at the, at the end of it where um, the, the buildup of inventories um, makes a huge difference. And that's a, that's a typical, what you see in a, a typical economic cycle, you know, that, that's what helps cause these cycles. It's just that delay in, in orders and the, um, and the processing and, and um, the, the manufacturer goes through this period where very, very weak sales and so might be laying people off, which actually then goes back to reducing even more the retailers and, and, and you know, the, the, the interactive effects or, or on the upside where the manufacturer all of a sudden makes all this money that they, um, uh, and actually goes out and, and expands supply or, or goes and spends more money and, and buys a new boat or, or does whatever it is to, to get more money back into the economy that then helps the retailer along. So um, yeah, so this effect is, um, is sort of multifaceted and, and across, all across different periods right through, through, right through the economy. So you don't, you don't generally see effects as big as this um, you know, in one, uh, right across the entire economy, but um, you can see how that, that affects is happening. Interestingly, of course, that manufacturer may well need parts from somebody else, right? So oh, that yeah. they effectively become <laughs> the top of the chain, right? So you can see how that could be quite significantly magnified uh, across multiple lines of business and across multiple industries. Exactly. And every mm. layer you go down further has it swings about more wildly in terms yeah. of the um, in terms of the effects that that's hence, going to hence the chip shortage yes yeah absolutely yep. mm. and um and and then you know and the chip shortage as well is is a good example of where um uh that that's sort of interesting from a manufacturer's point of view because they haven't really the like the chip demand's been pretty strong right throughout what yep. they did though is the demand at the start was for um the, the car makers pretty quickly turned around as a chip, got, chip guys and said, you know what, we don't need, we're not going to sell many cars because there's this big downturn. Um, we're cutting our orders with you. And at the same time, um, the guys making laptops and, and iPads and, and all these other electronic devices for, for homes and webcams said, hey, we need heaps of chips because we're, we're going great guns. So they, um, 
they basically changed over their, their, their manufacturing processes to say, okay, we'll only make a small amount of cars and make all these extra um, devices. And now then the, uh, the car makers turned around sort of four or five months later and said, oh, actually, you know what? We do actually need that demand. And the chip makers went, said, well, we've already flipped our, our services across. We've already committed to, to, to making these other um, ones for, for other people. So it hasn't been as if there's this spare capacity. It's more about saying, well, the spare capacity has been taken up by something else. And so now they've got to build extra capacity or wait for the um, demand to sort of fall off in some of these other sectors. So, yeah. Um, so yes, that's, that's a typical one. Um, if you look at the current conditions then and say, okay, what, is, what does it look like for the, this is the US um, inventories to sales. And you can see that that went through pretty much what we spoke about. Um, there's this massive spike up higher as um, the sales, so sales dropped um, and, and all of a sudden people left with all these extra inventories. Um, and then um, it, it, it went dramatically lower as they then started to, um, as sales picked up and, uh, and, and the inventories didn't fill. And so that's the, the total lid. And you can see we're sort of right at this bottom. And so, that, so the thought and, the, and what um, uh, you're looking at from a sales perspective is saying, okay, well, that means people are going to have to buy uh, a hell of a lot extra just to sort of refill their inventories back up to the old levels, plus any extra demand. So it's actually going to be very strong, um, uh, very strong growth for, for manufacturers at the moment. And that's certainly true, but, but um, it, it sort of falls away a little bit once you start digging into the sectors. So if you look, if you break up between those three parts, we spoke about manufacturers, retailers, and um, wholesalers, you can see the manufacturers are actually, their sales to inventories are pretty good at the moment. Um, the, the wholesalers have fallen away a little bit and the retailers are the one that have fallen away a lot. And so that's that, what we were speaking about. You know, and, and I think if you, if you dug into this um, on, a more, uh, on, a, on a time levels a bit, a bit closer, you'd be able to see that um, the retail does lead the, the, the wholesalers, which then leads to manufacturers um, within these. Uh, so, so that looks like it's, it's, it's sort of headed for this cycle. Um, it is worth noting, though, that when you dig into the numbers, um, the, the, it's a lot of it's been the sales have been very strong. So the inventory is a little bit low compared to where they were. And, and I've done a two-year comparison here just to try and um, get rid of some of the noise. But um, yeah, so, so it's definitely that we're seeing very, very strong retail sales and inventories are a bit low. So I sort of say, you know, there's roughly a, about a, two-thirds of the reason for that ratio being low is because sales are a lot stronger than what they were. And then the other third is, is, is back to inventories being a little bit low. And so, um, yeah, okay, so that's sort of painting the, painting the picture of what's, what's causing this. Um, uh, keep in mind, this is, this is March data. Um, so we've got a little bit of April data and you can still see sales booming in April. And uh, you know, some sort of early reads in May, and it does seem as if um, you know, very much that the, the data we're getting um, is showing a continuation of this sign. Of these trends. And the other about, thing we've seen. Sorry, sorry. just a thought there. Of course, one of the things that happened was that uh, people got handed money, right? So you know, Absolutely. both businesses and consumers. So guess what? They're going to spend some they of spend it. Spend the money, and exactly. that's what you're seeing, right? Yeah, yeah. and that's where I'm coming to from this whole mm. super cycle part yep. is that we're seeing this sort of extraordinary convergence where we've had, um, yeah, we had a, sh a ship block up the, in, in those March data, there was a ship that blocked up um, the Suez Canal for, for 10 days or something like that, which, which is, you know, runs people's inventories down. You've got all these checks bouncing around the US um, for, you know, either direct stimulus or indirect stimulus. Um, you've got the same happening in a whole bunch of other countries around the, around the world. You have less people working, so more people um, sort of at, at home and, and um, so, so disruptions to the manufacturing. Um, so there's just all these all these factors that are all coming together all at once. And then the other, another thing you had is this um, uh, goods versus services part. So on the left-hand side here, I've got the um, personal consumption expenditures, which is basically everything you're spending, both goods and services in the US. And you can see that's, that's sort of returned back to its trend line. But the issue is you still can't travel um, and, you still, and, and there's still limitations on, on things like recreation and, and you know, the number of people you could have at sporting events and, and um, going to gyms and, and all these other factors that are, that are, that are, that are affecting um, a lot of services. And so what that's meant is when people are spending money, they've tended to be able to spend it on, they're, they're tending to, they, in the past they were tending to spend it on more on goods or, or certainly in the past now, but even, even more so in the, in the data we're talking about, the January, February, March data, 
was that people would be spending it um, on goods because that's what you could spend it on. You just didn't have the opportunity to spend it on services. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant was all this data we've got about inventories, like this is all this all affects goods. The services you know, effect is, is much less on, uh, on, on these. So one more event that's saying, okay, um, uh, all, the, plus, all those folks, things we just spoke about, about extra stimulus checks, but one more is that people were spending on goods because they had to. Um, and if you look at the, some of this latest data, the, the April data, you can see that that's starting to reverse. Mm. So, um, so the bottom bottom levels is, is all the good service is all the goods, and you can see that recreation is really starting to take off, and food and service and stuff like that within within that data. So yeah, so one sort of more reason why we're looking at this real super cycle for this inventory. So so what I showed before was a typical inventory cycle. Um, this one's going to be supercharged because there's this extra demand. So the implication there will be to look at retail sales ahead, right? Because if retail sales, you know, drift lower rather than go a lot higher, then that will be a confirmation of what you're saying. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And 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 but also getting digging into that retail sales in the same way this chart's done over mm. here, in that you 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 care about you know if people are spending more money on on things like um, you know massages or haircuts or or things like that, that's the services sector starting to, starting to take off again. And you don't have a, um, you know, when, when you line up for a haircut, it's not as if um, you know, the, the hairdresser needs to go and order all these extra things from, from suppliers and everything like that. It's, it's generally, um, you yeah, know, it just doesn't, doesn't have the same. It's, it's all about the, uh, most of the costs in these places is employees. And so, um, so you don't have that same inventory cycle in the services sector, but you do have it in the goods sector. And so, um, yeah. So then you say, okay, well, um, so, what's there's, there's a measure out there called capacity utilization, which is basically um, how much capacity is there in, uh, in in the US. So, are they are they running at full capacity, where you know, usually above eighty percent would be considered pretty full capacity, so that um, when when there's new orders come through, the people have to go out and build new factories or or, or go and make new things, and so um, so that adds to inflation because you get these 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 real shortages. Or is there actually still a lot of spare capacity in, in this in the U.S. economy? And, and you look and you go, yeah, well, it's it's at 75%, which is um, you know below the lowest level it reached over the prior 10 years, um, you know, before the before the coronavirus hit. So um, yes, certainly you'd say there's still lots of spare capacity sitting within the in the U.S., which would say that um, this isn't something unique. It's not something where there's a long-term pressure that, yes, all these supply shortages are going to turn into long-term inflationary pressures for, for the rest of the economy. Um, keeping in mind as well that, yes, we've, we've de I'm, not, I'm not saying we haven't seen short-term price rises in, in a lot of different goods, and we have. The question is, will these continue? It's a bit like your toilet paper example. The toilet paper prices tripled, um, if you can find them, <laughs> uh, in, that, in that first part of the, the coronavirus. If you had a view that, yes, though, not only have they tripled, but from that new position, they're going to keep rising year after year, then you've got inflation and this, this embedded inflation. But if you're looking at it going, no, no, that's just a short term, the supply will come on, people will stop wanting to have, you know, cupboards and, 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 and garages full of toilet paper just in case, um, and they'll actually start working down their, their existing supply, then it's just a cycle and, and that will pass. And that's my view on, on most goods. There are some that, um, you know, uh, it does look like there's capacity constraints, but um, as, as, as a big picture, it does look as if most of this is really just a, a, a typical inventory cycle, supercharged by, by extra demand and by, um, by lack of supply. And interestingly, the lumber futures in the US, which had been very, very high, right, have slipped back this last week, um, which would suggest, again, the same sort of issue, right? This is a short-term thing rather than a structural thing. Yeah, and, and and actually, I must admit that you probably hit on the one of the ones where I'm, I um, I don't know. I think there's certainly the prices are very high in that, they're dramatically higher. And but I do think maybe they'll they'll probably stay a little bit higher than the past in terms mm. of something like lumber, where you, you go, okay, is there a structural change in demand between um, high rise and uh, low rise houses? And I'd say yes. The answer is you know, pretty much seems as if around the globe, people have made the decision that that living in a uh, an apartment now should be ch much cheaper than living in a house because in case you go into shutdowns and you want a backyard and, and, and those factors. And, and the more work from home means that you can live further away from where you work. So um, what that generally means is less steel and, and more lumber. 
mm. is, is a rough is a rough guide. And lumber is not something which you can just turn on pretty quickly um, in terms of the uh, you know it does if you get too much demand there, it takes a while to, to grow um, new new supply. Uh, and so I do think there's a there's some part where you probably see a little bit of elevated, elevated prices, but um, by the same token, I do think there's I think the current prices we've seen is a is very much just an inventory cycle. Um, but what will happen is I think the rise and then fall back to a uh, come back to a level that might be higher than where it was in the past for for, for say lumber, mm. versus uh, something like toilet paper where where it's yeah it's gone up high but it's come back down to the, the same level as where it was before or lower. Um, okay, so so your concern though when this happens is that um, what is that companies in the industry think that this is a new normal and that they go out and spend all extra on capacity. And so let's use, I mean, not that toilet paper makers did this, but toilet paper makers might have sat there and looked and gone, hey, um, all of a sudden our sales have just doubled in the last month. Um, I need to build a new factory to double my, my output. And then they go and build their new factory and then bring their new factory online only to find that the sales is actually was only a one or two period. And then they've got all this extra capacity and then they've got a. Then they're saying, "Well, we're sitting there with it. We've just built this new factory. We've got all this extra output. What are we going to do to try and get rid of it? Well, we're going to cut our prices, and then you actually end up with with uh, deflation or, or disinflation rather than inflation. So, so the danger in this cycle for for people who are looking for inflation is that um, we have all these shortages. The companies then go out and spend all this extra money to create all extra supply, and in the meantime. The demand comes off just as a typical cycle, as we, we spoke through that inventory cycle, and then um, you actually end up with prices lower than where they be were before. So I've, I've thrown up two charts now here. One is just showing um, gross fixed capital formation, which is a, sort of a measure of spend in, in the US. And you can see that um, in particular on uh, internet, oh, sorry, internet, on uh, ICT's information communications technology uh, equipment and software, um, there is a massive boom in terms of capex, um, and then if you look at the capital goods, you can sort of see that that boom away as well. So um, there, you know, I guess there's there's a question about um, you know is this just a lot of people moving things online that, that might have been offline, and so that would say okay you haven't got a, a capex boom, um, and you're not going to see all this extra this extra demand come out, but um, they're, they're, I don't doubt there's going to be some areas where you will see. Uh, excess supply you know, brought on because of this. And the longer it goes on as well, the longer we have this supply shortage, and the longer we see these, um, uh, you know, this, this demand supply mismatch, uh, then uh, the more capex you're going to see uh, coming on because the, the, you know, the first step is people go, oh, no, this is things returning to normal. And they go, wow, demand's pretty high, isn't it? And then, hey, it's still high. You know, and here we are two months in. Wow, maybe it is going to be stay high. You know, now I do need to go and build a new factory or or hire new staff, or do whatever it is to to, to increase capacity. Mm, it's so, worth re worth reflecting, isn't it? Here in Australia, uh, companies were given extra tax write-offs, effectively, to buy capex. Right. Exactly. So the government's also thrown f fuel on the fire as well to try and encourage mm. people to spend more on capital expenditure. Right. So yep. another reason why you might see a spike. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's, I think a lot of countries have done something similar, mm. not, not to the extreme. Yeah. Australia's been quite extreme. But <laughs> um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of countries who are, who are encouraging um, capital expenditure because they know that that, that'll get people out and working. But um, if that's the case, if that's where most of the money stimulus is going, then you don't get inflation from, um, you get short term inflation from, from, from this capex boom, but you don't get longer term inflation as, yep. as all the extra supply comes on. Um, and, and the Australian, um, you know, we see our, uh, you know, the iron ore part um, back in and and the uh, iron ore and, and gas back in um, sort of 2012 was a good example of that where there was just an incredible amount of um, capital expenditure and we saw prices and we saw salaries going up and, and truck drivers you know driving for hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and all that and then the that that boom finished and um, uh, all this extra supply flooded on and the iron ore price went from two hundred dollars a ton back down to to, to forty dollars a ton. Mm. And the question is, you know, is this something similar that's going to happen um, in in this round? And um, there's certainly in in, the, in in something like that. I don't want to harp on too much about the the uh, commodities because we spoke a lot about that last time. But but that's a good example of one where um, uh, Vale, which is the world's biggest supplier, is is increasing it back from it. It actually reduced the, um, 
production for, for a number of different reasons, and it's now going to increase back from 300 uh, million tonnes a year to, to 400 million tonnes, which is bringing on this huge wave of extra supply um, you know, at, at 200 um, plus dollars a tonne is, is great, but that's, that's the type of thing that then drives the price back down to, um, to, to low levels. Uh, okay, so then we have the CapEx. Um, so, yeah, so, the, so the overall, though, the, the net effect of all that is, is what we're looking at is um, yeah, capacity expansion. We've got stimulus checks. You've got pent-up reopening demand. So um, the, uh, consumer savings really spiked a lot higher. And then as economies are reopening, um, the uh, consumer is getting out and spending that money. So there's this pent-up demand within that. Um, you've got uh, the goods versus services. You haven't been able to buy services. So there's, there's a goods are sort of overemphasized in, in terms of people spend. Um, there's, uh, uh, we've been had supply issues in terms of um, people not being able to work in, uh, because, of, because of lockdowns and, and shutdowns. And uh, there's been supply issues from the Suez Canal being blocked up. It's just a, a, a litany of different factors that are all sort of coming together all at once to create this, um, what we're calling an inventory super cycle. So, so the big question is, how long does an inventory super cycle last for? And um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, you know. Every different industry's got different timeframes, uh, where, where the economy is a lot more, as we spoke about before, the economy is a lot more services focused now than, than, than what it used to be. And so you'd think it, it, it should pass quicker. Um, a, a more extreme example would be post-World War II, is, is, is what I think is a good, good example of something extreme. So, um, and I pick on the US again, um, but you, know, you saw in the US, uh, all of the returned soldiers came back, uh, your factories, uh, if you were building tanks, now you, you converted back to building cars. If you were making um, uh, you know, fatigues for army fatigues for, for uniforms, you now converted back to making you know, clothing and, um, and, and, and accessories for, um, for, for sort of retail markets. Uh, you might've been out with this creating steel for battleships. Now you're creating steel for, for high-rise buildings. Like there was a significant change and, and retooling that the economy needed to do. Uh, that lasted about two to three years. So that's, to me, that's your, your, your extreme end. Um, pushing back to, to, to where we are today and, and considering we've already been in this for a couple of months already, my expectation would be somewhere between um, you know, three or four months and, and a year seems, seems reasonable. And I think we're sort of at least two to three months already into this process. So, um, yeah, so I guess what, where I'm looking at is, is somewhere between one or two months and, and, and six months is, is the most likely scenario for me. Um, but uh, we're watching the data very closely and trying to work out when does this actually happen and, and what does it actually mean for, for investors. So, um, yeah, hard, one of those ones, just impossible to know, but um, uh, I think very important for looking for signs that, that is happening because all the signs do seem to be showing that, that this is what's happening. It is an inventory super cycle. And so now it's looking for when does that peak? What are the, what are the effects? And when does it start to come off? So does that all, all make sense, Martin? Yes, no, it does, absolutely. And I think it's very important for people to understand the difference between the super cycle you've just been speaking about, right? And the, the, you know, the more standard um, theory about inflation, because this is a very different way of thinking about it, right? But it seems to me much more close to what's actually happening, looking on the data that I've been looking at. Exactly. And you, so you see um, the purchasing, uh, there's two types of um, main ones out there, a, a P, what they call a PPI, which is a purchasing price index, and then the CPI, the consumer price index. And uh, the, the PPIs are certainly very high, uh, but they also as well, in you know, we've been through periods where PPI has been very high, in, in, even in recent years, and it hasn't flowed through to, to consumer price inflation. And um, central banks tend not to, um, I mean, they notice PPI, but they tend not to, 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 to make it too much of a factor in their calculations until they actually see it flowing through into consumer price inflation. Mm. And of course, the fact is that it's wages that actually really starts moving inflation up, right? And as we discussed mm. the other day, there's really very little evidence of any wages inflation at all at the moment. No, and and look, you know, what what you, you can get a very good correlation if you run um, uh, wages versus unemployment. Mm. It's just sort of it's a very simple one. Um, you get a few funny reads recently where you had massive um, massive unemployment, but you know, if you cut those out um, and, and draw it back down, it it really does show that um, uh, you know, say in the US, they got 
to three and a half percent inflation, and they really weren't seeing much growth in wages, even at, even at those levels. So uh, you'd expect that um, there's this uh, uh, what's a there's a, a funny term economists use, which is basically the the level at which unemployment get can get to without causing um, oh, yes. more inflation for the for the economy. The, the one that and, the Reserve Bank just defined lower. Exactly, yeah. and they keep defining it lower and lower and lower. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so there's and 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 that part is they they thought it was like you know five percent was where once you got below 5% un- unemployment, then you're going to start causing inflation, and then it yep. was 45 and then it was 4 yep. And in the US, it got down, and, and they're going, well, we, at 35 it still wasn't really happening. So it's definitely trending up, it, wages inflation. You definitely get more wages inflation at 35 than what you do at 55 but it's still not um, wage inflation that is in any way concerning. Mm. And it's just worth noting, of course, that a lot of the jobs that have been created more recently are in the services sector, healthcare and age sector, right? Those wages... Yes. Are much lower to start with and, and whilst they might be moving up a little um, mm. overall the flow back into the real economy is actually relatively low so you know that there's some sus- suspicious movements as well which you think hang on a moment you know where is the wage price growth actually flowing through to is it actually mm. a fair quantum such that effectively it impacts the broader market and by the way of course the unemployment rate is also defined quite carefully so if you work for an hour a week then you're not unemployed right so yeah ab- excellent yeah absolutely you, you're on un- you're under employment's more important than, mm. than that but uh, um yeah i guess what you i guess where you're leading, leading to it there as well is that a lot of those um uh a lot of those wages when you start talking about uh government jobs um and and large sector jobs, there's there's, there's much lower levels of uh, unionisation than what than what we had, you know, 30 years ago as well. Mm. But um, it's a little bit of a, a lagging in terms of it's we're seeing such low um, wage growth in that sector because and and the government sort of turns around and goes well, um, inflation's low and therefore um, we're not going to put your wages up. And then they go, but we want more inflation. Yes. It's like, well, just a minute. No. Yeah. Don't you actually yeah. hold the, the tools in your hand? <laughs> like well, they've the actually RBA... frozen. They've frozen gov- government sector pay, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and so and um, you know the RBA itself um, had a you know a discussion with its own union and, and capped pay rises at I think something around two percent. Yeah. But um, and then turned around in speeches, you know, a week later, you know, decrying about you know why we can't get wage inflation. And it's yeah. Saying, well, have well, a look in your own backyard. See, I, I've got this theory that uh, the RBA is quite conveniently now hitched onto the, uh, we've got to get unemployment down because we've got the wages growth up because it's quite a convenient reason why they shouldn't start thinking about their monetary policy, right? It's quite yes. a ex- good excuse, really. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, but I, I do think as well, I mean, I've, from, a, from a social good perspective, um, we would like to have more people working than not working. And so... Uh, I do think there's a, a positive in terms of saying if we can have, uh, you know, we definitely want wages higher though as well. Like you don't want people out there, um, you know, breaking breaking rocks on 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 roads and picking up rubbish as a as a, as a new form of job. But um, you do want people in in sort of knowledge economy and feeling good about their their work. Hmm. But um, you know, for me, it's very much one of those. I would much prefer to have um, to see government spending more money on, on say, research and development, and and more money on terms of trying to get uh, the economy going and by employing people, rather than giving, say, a universal basic income where um, people might not feel very good about themselves being told, um, "Hey, Barton, here's some money. Uh, guess what? You don't have to work anymore because society doesn't need you." You know, so I'm saying, "Well, that's." <laughs> I know yeah. it's socially it might help, but from that, but I think mentally it's not going to. Um, yeah, mentally that's not going to help. Well, you know, there are some experiences where UBI can lead to positive outcomes, but not always. But the other point I'd make is it's about the quality of the job and the rate of pay for the job, right? What we want is well-paid yes. quality jobs, not mm. low-paid, fragmented part-time jobs that are really, really paid rock-bottom prices. I mean, that's the problem we've got yes. at the moment. Mm. Absolutely. And, and you need, so you need that lower unemployment. So yep. you need lower unemployment so that people can't, can't offer those jobs because they offer the jobs and, and nobody will take them. Mm. And... Um, People who do have those jobs will either demand higher wages or, or move into industries where they can. And so I know that's not, you know, for, it's it's not possible at the moment. But um, yeah, if if we can get the right type of growth, then then it is possible. So I guess then the the implication question of all this is, what does it mean in terms of you know portfolio setting, right? Because 
basically there are a lot of people out there saying oh inflation is going to rocket away therefore you need to protect against inflation which would suggest things like gold and those sorts of things which has protect potentially some inflation and protection but if in fact it's deflationary or flat it changes the story doesn't it it, it absolutely does yes and so we'll go uh, i'll we'll come back i'll come back on another time and we'll dig i guess into into a lot more detail on that side mm. because um i think there's a you know that there's certainly something to that but i think that the thing for me at the moment i guess the big picture is that um there's still going to be a couple of high inflation reads so we've got one coming up later on this week uh, and then um, uh, where the base effect is going to be even greater. So, so a lot of the data I was showing was, was looking at two-year data because I, I wanted to get rid of this base effect where we had this, this real drop last year and then a, then a rise. And so um, the May point is sort of the low point in, in that inflation drop. So, so this next read, when we look back, the base is going to be even lower than what it was um, last time. And so, uh, yeah, it's going to be... For me, it's about saying, um, recognizing that, look, we do think this is where it's headed. We do think there's an inflation super cycle. We think you're going to see slowing in China. And we think that um, structurally, uh, economies are different to what they were in the past. And so you won't get that same flow, flow through of inflation with the econ economic conditions as they are today. But the flip side is, it's going to, it's going to keep looking like there's inflation for, for a couple of months still. And maybe as long as six months, um, we're still going to look like there's inflation. And so for me, it's about saying, well, you you want to you can either go all in and say, yep, I'm just going to go all in, and I'm going to assume this is absolutely going to happen exactly the way as I've described it. And then you're running a danger though that that things might change. Um, we might see a huge uh, fiscal stimulus, another huge fiscal stimulus in the in the US. You might see uh, minimum minimum um, uh, wage rises in, in the US or, or or throughout Europe sort of get up. You might see some sort of, you know, there's all these other, there's all these overall factors you could see that might actually end up forcing, um, causing that that to happen. And so it's about, it's a matter about, and that's what we'll talk about next time is about how do you position your portfolio in the short term um, to to account for that, and then how do you position your portfolio over the next, um, you know, as as it comes out and you get more confidence with what's going on. And so, you know, our position was that um, for the last few months was that. We haven't really changed our view on, on, on how it's happening, but we could see this inflation scare coming. And so it was saying about, well, we can't have a portfolio set up for, for deflation if there's an inflation scare coming. And mm -hmm. so you need to change your portfolio to make sure that as the inflation scare came, um, we wouldn't be too far, too much put out. Now our stocks would, would outperform. Now it's about saying, okay, well, when do we when do we turn that into into something different? And and that's you know over a few months, uh, and then. And what are the what are the sort of guidelines and what are the, the posts you're going to look at that that'll, that'll determine when you turn it, and then the final part is um, what do you actually turn it into? What is, where does it look? And so we'll do that do that in more data, detail later on this week. Yeah, uh, it sounds it sounds very interesting and it's very uh, pertinent conversation. The other point I'd make is there is a risk now potentially for policy error on the on the part of central banks, right? Yes. If they start to get pushed because the market thinks and because all the commentators think inflation is coming, going right back mm. to the beginning, you know, you can actually almost make inflation come if enough people think inflation is coming, right? And it may be that then actually the reserve banks around the world and the central banks around the world reacts to that. So that for me is a really important thing to watch as well. Yes, and and that's exactly that um one of those like I spoke about it being between say one and six months for this whole inventory cycle and and, and um and China um, slow down sort of all to come all to sort of get some traction is that if it's one month then um, yeah central banks aren't going to move much in that time and they're not going to change but if it turns into four five six months you know in six months time if you've had six months worth of um, you know four or five percent inflation prints um, central banks are going to be they're going to be moving and, and maybe they maybe they you know, maybe even see some too much tapering or, or, or some rate rises in, in some countries and and actually you know so so when the when the um, when these factors when the super cycle um, of inventory is over and uh, you start seeing everything turned down if if they've tightened financial conditions uh, you know, that could really lead to a, to another leg down so yeah. basically the longer it the longer it goes on elevated the more dangerous it's going to get yeah, absolutely. Well, I think watching for policy missteps now is probably more critical than ever because I think that uh, the polarised views that are out there, 
could potentially lead us up the garden path if we're not careful. So watch the data, I guess, is the, is the first message, but also I'm trying to understand what's really going on behind the data, which is what your presentation, I think, has done brilliantly. So really yeah. appreciate that today. And um, we'll come back and have a bit of a conversation down the track as to what are the poly, um, of the portfolio implications of all of this, because they are quite profound. Absolutely. Thanks, Martin. Really appreciate it. Thanks. See you next time.